Well, good evening. evening. Why don't we get started? Open in prayer. Father, we want to turn to you once again. Uh, Lord, on this uh, Thanksgiving week, we want to extend our incredible hearts of gratitude towards the things that you have done, Lord God. We know we're not worthy of your uh, blessings of salvation, of the blessings of your presence in our lives, Lord God. We don't, can't do anything really to earn it except to surrender to you and ask for your blessings to flow upon us as we know you desire to do, Lord. So we want to just offer a, a heartfelt thanksgiving to you, Lord God, for giving us this time and opportunity to get closer to you through your word, to uh, understand, Lord God, that your spirit is here to guide us and teach us in all truth. So help us to surrender to him as we um, always want to do, Lord God. We want to commit this time into your hands, ask you to give us great insights and wisdom uh, that we can use for a lifetime, Lord God, to know you better, to understand our relationship to you, Lord God, and how important it is that we recognize that uh, while we are yet sinners, you have come in the flesh and suffered and died for us, Lord God. So we thank you for that gift, and thank you for this time, which is also a gift to us, Lord God. So we thank you for that and ask you to bless everyone who's here and everyone who may watch online, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's get started here. Slowly but surely making our progress through uh, the opening chapters of Genesis. So we looked at chapters 1 and 2. Last week we took a look at chapter 3, the first seven verses. We'll cover verse 7 again tonight. Kind of left us on a cliffhanger. I know this is uh, shocking. Uh, Eve was uh, was deceived by the serpent in the in the in the garden, and um, he convinced her to take of that forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she ate, and she gave to her husband, and he ate. And we didn't get to see what happened after that. So I guess it's all a big mystery. You know that perfect sinless world of absolute perfection. I wonder what happened. Oh, well, look here we are in a world far less than perfect and certainly less than what God intended it to be. Um, and we look, recognize when we look in the mirror or we look at our newspapers or information sources that we live in a very fallen world that is cursed, um, in a sense, because of what Adam and Eve did as where we left off last time. So with that really quick opening, let's jump into the text. I'm going to read through the entirety of the rest of chapter 3. We'll kind of cover it in sections here. But uh, chapter 3 is obviously just went through that. The serpent deceived Eve, told her that maybe God wouldn't actually uh, give the consequences for the sin, and actually God was in some way restricting or harming Adam and Eve by not letting them take of this tree from the knowledge of good and evil. So with that, let's take a look at uh, the responses and the aftermath of what happened here. So in verse, well, I guess I went with verse 6, yeah. So in verse 6 it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. Then Yahweh God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. 
Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, Yahweh God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God, Yahweh God, said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore Yahweh God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned in every way to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, well, that's the last part of chapter 3. With any uh, expediency, we'll get through that tonight. See how we do. So first section here, I just want to, again, take this kind of by section by section. We did expose ourselves to this verse last week in verse 7, but I want to make sure we cover it again because I really wanted to focus on last week that they both took and they both ate, and we kind of talked about a little scenario about how that might have happened somewhat simultaneously. Um, again, there's lots of different scenarios I'm sure you could envision. You know, did she go to the tree, pick the fruit, but not eat it? Did she go get her husband and say, let's go look at that tree again? Maybe it's better for fruit than we ever thought it was. You know, we can envision all kinds of scenarios that Scripture doesn't tell us. But what it does say is that the woman took and eat, then she gave to her husband who was with her, seemingly at the same moment in time, and he ate. So it's fairly synonymous. And we see that the results of eating of that fruit were instantaneously and synonymous uh, or, or simultaneous, maybe is the word I didn't even say, um, in the sense that whatever happened to them, it happened when both ended up taking of the fruit. Okay. So the man and woman both took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They both took it. They both consumed it, and they both suffered consequences for it. Um, but as I said last week, and we'll say again throughout this particular chapter and wherever it may come up again, is that Adam is the one who's always charged with the offense, the sin. Um, Eve was deceived. That doesn't mean she was innocent. But it does say that Adam wasn't deceived, and Adam took, and all of the world suffers because of Adam's sin, is what we find in this passage here, as well as in the New Testament, like Romans chapter 5 is a great place to review that. It, was, it says, then their eyes were, I believe, simultaneously open to the reality of what they had done. It, it, and so, again, um, as we talk about this whole fall and how many hours or days or whatever it may have been, um, I think you can see here that there seems to be virtually no time gap between when Eve took and when Adam took. It seemed to be very, very close, if not simultaneous, when they had done that. Okay? Because it was that they were, it was after he took, they both looked at one another or looked at whatever they could see and recognize we're exposed, we're naked, we're, um, we're now feeling shame that we've done something against God. So the fruit from it, I'll just re, kind of mostly refer to this as the forbidden fruit rather than the whole tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, just to make it a little more simplified. They, they took the fruit from the forbidden tree, uh, or the fruit from the forbidden tree did not cause them to become evil. That's, notice that. It didn't somehow like poison them or infect them. There was nothing wrong with the fruit other than they had a commandment not to take from it, had a commandment not to eat from it. Um, so it wasn't poisonous, it didn't, you know, God didn't put this, you know, injection of sin and evil into them. They just disobeyed God from a, what was clearly a perfectly good tree to eat from, except that God said, don't eat from it. So they then, uh, they, the man and the woman discovered, because they had disobeyed God, 
that they had then committed this act of evil. Evil is a result of their choices, their actions, and as I said, Adam being the head and Adam being the head of the human race is therefore charged with it, but it was they recognized we sinned. God commanded us not to, and we have changed. We've become evil, and that means that that evil has, has revealed itself in the understanding and the awareness that we are naked. And not only are we naked, we're ashamed of who we are and what we have done. Obviously something they had never experienced before. Now, as we talked about maybe last week, um, or maybe two weeks ago, I don't remember now exactly when, you know, we talked about the possibility that you know, they may have been clothed in extra dimensionality or light or something like that. And then having taken from that fruit, they did see an actual physical change in their own nature, characteristic, and makeup, which makes them more like us than more like whatever they used to be in the garden. Okay? But no matter what, they could either look down or look across at the person standing right next to them and say, uh-oh, we don't look like we did a minute ago, right? Something is different, something has changed, and it's that they committed this act of evil. Again, the fruit wasn't evil or wicked, it was the choice that they made that was wicked and evil. So the concept of evil was no longer for them esoteric or theoretical. God said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What's evil, Lord? It's the thing that happens if you take from this tree, right? It's, it's sort of theoretical or esoteric. Well, the moment they crunched down on that fruit, whatever it is, it's often referred to as an apple, but it certainly doesn't say apple in the scripture, okay? When they took that bite, it was no, evil was no longer a theoretical, esoteric concept. It was, that's us. We know, now know what evil is, and we're the ones who brought it into this garden. Okay. So evil was real. It was now a real experience. And they, they tr- obviously, as we see from the following events, understood what they did was wrong. Okay. We'll, we'll see that unveil or unfold as this account or as we unpack the account here through the the study. Okay. So the man and woman now had uh, a different reactions to their nakedness, right? They, as we saw at the very last verse of chapter two, they were naked and unashamed and the serpent was in the midst of the garden, right? But now they are naked and ashamed, very different understanding. Okay. Didn't say that they understood that they were naked in chapter two, but it says that they were naked and ashamed. Now they know that they're naked and they are ashamed of that. Okay. So um, what changed is they, this, they were aware of their change in status. Obviously there was self-awareness, self-recognition and understanding we are different and it's in, because of as resulting of our choice that we made, um, Again, not some kind of poison or magical part of the fruit. It was just a sin to disobey God. So they were now exposed to the whole garden, each other, one another, Adam and Eve, and the serpent, and to all of the garden, and of course to God, that they were now exposed to be sinners um, and incapable of, of defending himself, themselves against his judgment, right? Right? God said, don't eat it. When the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. He's telling them, don't, there's a command and consequences. And they are absolutely suffering from uh, a recognition. We can't solve our own problem. Okay. Well, they think they can for a moment, maybe. Okay. So regardless of whether human dream, oh, I just put this in here. I don't know if this has any bearing or not, but I, I, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but if you ever had a dream that you were naked and in public somewhere, you know, you woke up and you were like, hey, I'm missing something, and, you know, I'm, you know, running around, I'm trying to find something to cover myself with. Uh, I don't know that those dreams about being naked in public have anything in related to Genesis chapter 3, although I wouldn't be surprised if that's, you know, that might be there's some kind of linkage there. But if you've had that dream and you can think to where you were in that thought process, Okay, I just, I just, you know, for me it always happened when I was in grade school or something, you know, oh, I went to grade school and I forgot all my clothes. And, you know, um, uh, you know you, but you think about, oh, how horrible that would be, how embarrassing that would be, how, how, you know, humiliating that would be. Well, think that probably is the feeling Adam and Eve had, recognizing we are out in public and we are naked and we are ashamed and we are horrified by, by the fact that, you know, we've been exposed in this way. Okay. 
So I think that might be, give us a sense of what that sensation for Adam and Eve might have been. Again, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but if you've ever had that kind of dream, you had that sense of, wow, I'm helpless and hopeless and need, need to get, find something to fix my problem very, very quickly. Okay. I'm really I, looking forward to dreaming tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, planting thoughts. Well, you'll have to let me know if that works. All right. So, um, it also, interesting, if you know from your study of the Old Testament, you know, that, that this is the first time the word knew, Adam and Eve knew that they were naked. Well, if you recognize a little bit, a chapter or so later, that Adam's going to know his wife Eve, and she's going to conceive. It's the same word, right? It's that ex- highly experiential understanding that moves an idea or, or, or concept from, again, theoretical to actual. You can, you can study about conception, or how husband and wife are come together in copulation. You can read about it in textbooks and all that, but until you experience it, you really don't know, do you? Right? It's the same kind of thing. In now sense, they were naked, and they knew that they were naked, and they were ashamed of it, They'd act, and they had actually experienced evil. Right, so now it's a whole different understanding. That, you know, we, we talk about knowing like it's always, always up here. Okay? For, for the Hebrew word, the range of semantic meanings of the Hebrew word, it means, a lo- it means actually a lot more than some kind of intellectual comprehension. It means you actually have direct, personal, experiential knowledge of something. And that's what they had. They, the first time they experientially knowledge, had knowledge of something was in taking this fruit and knowing that they're naked and knowing that they had committed uh, some form of evil against God. So as I said, that Hebrew word, if you don't know, is called yada, um, and, it means to de- and it really describes the experience that they had. As I said, it's a common Old Testament reference to sexual intercourse as one potential context you show it up or it appears in, but it also has a broader range of meanings, which include any kind of firsthand experience. So they had, again, not what God wanted for them, but they now had firsthand experience with sin, rebellion, disobedience, nakedness, um, and, sh- and shame, to name just a few kind of thoughts and emotions. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you think that would also apply to the concept of pain? Yeah. I mean, you're going to get to that, but yeah. I think they know. Yeah, well, they, yeah, they would have had no concept of pain, right? And so now all of these things are starting to become reality, and eventually, we've, even if they haven't experienced pain in the moments between this, they certainly will. And, but I, I bet you that, you know, we, we can only guess and imagine the kind of conversations that God with Adam and Eve may have had before this fall, but it could have been far more extensive than what we see here. And he could have told them about all of the things that they would experience it should they disobey him. And they may have thought about it, but, you know, it's, it's not all that different if the example of whatever is a, is a three-year-old or four-year-old kid, and you tell them, don't touch the stove, it's hot, but they just won't avoid it, and they must touch it and find out what it means to be hot. And then they realize that was really stupid, right? It's the same kind of experience, even if the circumstances are a little bit different. So the lesson here is, of course, to trust in God at all times. That's what God, God said. If you eat, you will die. Just trust me, it's not worth the experience. And they're learning here, and hopefully we would learn here from th- some things, that we don't have to experience everything the world throws at us to know if God says it's wrong, I don't need it. It won't, it won't actually bring me satisfaction or joy or peace or whatever that my, my psychology or, my, or the little demons and devils and Satan might tell me it's so good about. Um, it's, it, we don't have to experience those things. We just need to trust God's word. It's a first you know, real definition that we've got to try and push deeper and, pr- and more, more powerfully into the presence of God so that he defines what we should be thinking about, what we should act upon, rather than saying, well, if I haven't experienced it myself, and then I just can't really know for sure. If God tells us something, we can know it for sure. Well, and then we see what I would call the first act of false religion in Scripture. Okay. And it's consistent with all acts of false religion. It's going to be that man tries to um, work out his own problem for himself. Okay. And wh- knows he needs a covering for his sin and tries to form and fashion some kind of covering for himself. 
So the man and woman, it says, sewed fig leaves together to make tunics to cover their nakedness. They realize we got a problem, and if we sew fig leaves together, that will cover over, that's kind of the same word for atonement, cover over our nakedness. And they, weren't, they didn't turn to God and say, God, you must be merciful and gracious. We realize we've made a great big error. Rather than running to ourselves for a problem, let's run to God. No, they began to look around and say, how can we fix this problem? And, and don't, don't we, or maybe if you're great at these, maybe you don't, but isn't it, you know, you, you break somebody's doorknob and, and, and you, you, like, you go to their house, you're visiting, you break their doorknob, and you're like, oh, I've got to fix this before every, everybody any finds out, right? Or, or you know, you, you do something and, you know, I don't know, run a shopping cart into somebody's car, and you're like, oh, I, see if I can rub that thing out a little really quick, and nobody will know I did it, right? It's always about trying to fix the problem before anybody finds out that you've done something that would be dangerous or harmful to somebody else or to their property. So their solution, I want you to recognize, if you haven't thought about this before, really their solution would have failed to meet even the most basic needs of being covered over. Okay? Um, fig leaves can't possibly be comfortable to wear. I can't imagine, no matter how well you, you can sew, that they would in any way be comfortable to wear. I imagine that fig leaves would wear out or break down very quickly. You know, you snap them off and you sew them together and they start drying out, becoming more crunchy and crumbly each and every moment as the time passes, right? Huh? They tear easily. And they tear easily. Well, yeah, it's the first time you need to relieve yourself. They don't have a Yeah. Yep. No, no. Yeah. No, they can't be very practical. Um, and it would really only serve as a false confidence for their problem of sin. God and the rest of creation would obviously still be aware that they were sinners, right? Then walking around in fig leaves now would only for them give the, like a placebo of, hey, we tried to cover our sins, but they still know they're sinners. And all the world knows, especially God, knows that they're sinners. They're not solving any problems here. Uh, they're just trying to, to avoid consequences as quickly as they can. So as, in, as I said, rather than turning to God, uh, uh, the man and woman tried to remedy their own problems by taking matters into their own hands. And it's a sad, but it's an ongoing response that we would see today, right? People get into problems and sin and choices that they make that are not good, and rather than coming to God, coming to the Bible, coming to a trusted brother or sister in Christ or spiritual leader of some sort or another, they try to fix the problem really quick and make it go away. Okay. We've got to come to God and seek God's solution in all things um, rather than rel being reliant and dependent on our own resources and ingenuity to solve a problem that God says don't engage in false religion. That's, these are the kind of things that false religion are known for. So with the knowledge of their nakedness, the man and woman decided to cover up, which is an, you know, an inadequate attempt at atonement uh, for their sin and nakedness, right? They're trying to overcome, cover up their sin and nakedness, which obviously failed. So this failed action established really the foundational approach, if I would say, of all false religions, whereby man seeks to please God, or I put in parentheses here, or please himself, through his own works to cover his sins. Okay? Every false religion, no matter how similar to Christianity it is, Catholicism or Mormonism or whatever, or Islam or anything else, is all based on how can I make, show myself to be good? How can I twist God's arm to say, God, aren't I so good that you'll, you surely must be favorably thinking about me, right? Some kind of works-based religion. Even Judaism did, failed to recognize that God was instituting symbolic practices to show our need for relationship with God. But, but Old Testament Judaism, and most certainly the retooled, repackaged Judaism of today, is all about doing good works to make God happy with us, right? Well, what are Adam and Eve doing here right here in the garden? They're trying to atone and correct their own problem 
so that God will look over and, and, and say, ah, oh, well, I thought, you'd, I thought I'd come down here and find you naked, but I, I see you're covered. Okay, I guess I'll just keep going. No, but that's every false religion. I you know, challenge you to think about any religious system you can think of and ask yourself, is it based on grace and salvation, or is it based on works to make a deity happy with the efforts of the man? All false religions typically fall into that. And the, and the more closely they are aligned to Christianity but are still false, the more you would expect to see works-based actions associated with that doctrine, false religion. So God immediately steps in and corrects their faulty doctrine of thinking they could atone for their own sins by demonstrating how he alone provides the necessary covering for man's sin. And we're going to see it as this story unfolds by the shedding of innocent blood. Okay? Immediately, right from the get-go, and when we talk about that, you can't get tunics of skin without shedding some skin and shedding some blood. And, and God is immediately going to show, this is how I'm going to show you. Here's a model. An innocent animal will die. Its blood will be shed. I'm going to take the, the sacrifice and the offering that it made for your guilt in, it, in, in its own innocence, and I'm going to cover you over with its, the skin from its body. This is a picture of Christ on the cross. This is a picture of what God will do several thousand years later at the cross, 4,000 years later. Okay. Now, the sewing, the stitching, as, as Linda talked about, you know, of the fig leaves, I do want you to recognize, though, it does reveal a very strong level of intellectual capacity of the man and woman. It wasn't the right choice, but don't, let, let's, we got to get away from picturing Adam and Eve as these kind of innocent, bumbling little creatures who know how to pick and eat fruit, and they don't know how to do anything else, and they can't think their way out of problems. Can you imagine? They've never seen a piece of, piece of clothing ever in their life before. But they look at those fig leaves, and they go, hmm, let's turn those into clothes. And it wasn't just like, let's walk around with a fig leaf and let's hold on to the fig leaf all day long. It was, let's sew them together and let's make a tunic out of it. Let's put something on. I mean, they've never seen any of this before. They've probably never sewn anything together before. But they find ingenuity ways, ingenious ways of trying to solve this problem. So let's give them a little bit of credit, at least for the intellectual capacity and problem-solving skills that God gave them from the start, even if it was for the wrong outcome or the wrong purposes. Okay. So I said, they'd never seen clothing before, but they could envision how to use it with the resources that were available to them. They saw a problem, and they saw a solution to the problem. They'd never sewn before, right? I mean, what, what would be the purpose of sewing in the garden? But somehow, some way, with whatever resources, they found some kind of some way of sewing together fig leaves, attaching, co connecting together these fig leaves in order to make them tunics for themselves. Pretty ingenious. You know, most of us, most of our ideas, you know, we talk about things like Hollywood, right? Hollywood never comes up with any new ideas. They just keep repackaging the same tropes and themes and storylines over and over and over and over again, right? And, and so, but, you know, how much, how much comes out of Hollywood that's fresh and new and completely innovative? No, that's just one example. But they'd never seen such a solution. They'd never seen an animal or a person wear clothes, and yet they kind of saw hey, we could do something here to solve our problem. So apart from their sin and attempt at self-correcting the problem, the man, we can acknowledge the man and woman would have had impressive, I think, abstract thinking and reasoning capacities or capabilities within their, within their intellectual capacity. Um, I, I think that's at least noteworthy because we're going to see mankind is incredibly intelligent as the book of Genesis continues to unfold. Uh, we, you know, that everything that for most of us that we learned in school about cavemen and grunts and, you know, knocking women over the head and dragging them around by their hair is not what the Bible says original man looked like. Highly intelligent, highly capable of, uh, in very complex intellectual thought. And we see development of that even in chapter, when we get to chapter four, we are going to see musical instruments and metalworking happening right from the get-go. They've already started those kind of activities. 
Okay, so there's Adam and Eve. They recognize they're naked. They've got a problem. They're going to cover themselves over with fig leaves in what I'm going to again refer to, or many refer to as the first act of false religion in Scripture. Then we see Yahweh God come to the garden. Okay, now I think it's obvious that God, Yahweh God, well, we'll talk about it, um, took a little pause. Between, he didn't like show up the minute they finished. They're still chewing the bite in their mouth, and he shows up, right, to confront them for their sin. He gives them some time, a little pause there to maybe contemplate what they've done and whether or not they're going to turn to him or not turn to him. So, uh, let's see, did I get that right? Okay. So it says that the man and the woman heard the sound of Yahweh walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So it's obviously a recognizable sound, something that they had heard. Let's talk about both that and the cool of the day phrase. So they must have heard this sound before in order to correctly identify it, because remember, they're hiding, they're going to hide in the bushes. Hiding in the bushes, they hear a sound they can't see, so they recognize that that's clearly God, not an animal or a stiff breeze or whatever. It's God walking in the garden. Okay. So the cool of the day can also be translated as breeze. Okay. And in some, in some scripture, I try to look up how many different ones, probably two two. Two out of three uh, English translations use cool of the day, and one out of three use breeze of the day, okay? Because it, it, it means the same, it, well, it can, it, the, it, a cool breeze, right? So the breeze co- creates a coolness, and, you know, so the word can mean breezy or cool in both of those senses, okay? So was it, you know, a, the cool or breezy part of the day, meaning this was like a regular and predictable cycle in God's garden? Right? So we have, remember we saw the mist coming up to water the plants, and we see kind of this kind of you know, uh, stuff that's happening in the garden. Well, is God walking through the garden a regular and predictable part of the day? Like most people would say in the evening, right? So it gets close to sunset or whatever, and God is walking through the garden at this time. That's how some people uh, see it, and I don't think there's anything wrong with viewing it that way. You could also ask, is it Yahweh himself that's causing the breeze? Is Yahweh walking through the garden in his powerful presence actually always creating this breeze, right? So it's not really clouds or, or you know, uh, astronomical events happening on the atmosphere, but it's actually God walking through the garden and maybe causing a breeze, okay? Uh, don't know, it's just a conjecture on that one. And the other possibility here is this the first Christology in the Old Testament, Okay. Is this where we first, you know, first time we've really seen Christ as a person in, um, in, the, in the scriptures, right? So we've, we've seen the, the plurality of the Trinity. We've seen let us make man in our image and that kind of phraseology. Um, but, is, but virtually from this, from this moment forward, in the book of Genesis and, and, and beyond, whenever we see the angel of the Lord or even that Jacob, let's say, was wrestling with God, or Abraham entertains the Lord, right, uh, directly and feeds him dinner, um, we would always refer to those now as Christologies, recognizing the second person of the Trinity showing up in human form is uh, consistent in the Old Testament before Christ shows up. If you were in my Zechariah study, we talked about Zechariah encountering this um, Christological figure, God figure in human form in the book of Zechariah. So it may be that this is actually Jesus showing up right here in Genesis chapter 3. doesn't say it, and there's not really a strong way of acknowledging it, but we do see the man and the woman recognizing Yahweh God walking in the midst of the garden, and, um, and they're going to have a conversation with him. Most of us, when it just generically says God, especially in the early chapters of Genesis, we would probably think, oh, that's the Father. But, you know, I, you know we, we recognize that Scripture says no one has ever seen God at any time. Jesus said that, right? And so could that include Adam and Eve? It might. Okay, but that's kind of how we typically resolve no one has ever seen God, Jesus says, and yet Abraham entertains the Lord, and Jacob wrestles with the Lord, and Joshua talks to the commander of the host of the Lord and all those things. This one could be the first Christology. If you go, no, I don't believe that's true, then, then it's generic God. If you think there's kind of a personage, human-figured form personage of God walking in the garden, then it's probably Christ, in my opinion. Okay. 
The important points here are that Adam and Eve did recognize his presence in the garden and that there was, I believe, a, a specific time of day or some kind of day, you know, por portion of the day marker associated with him coming to visit them. Okay, so those, those two points are, it was, they recognized him, you know, in figure form that this is God, and it was, seems to be a specific designation in the breeze of the day or in the cool of the day, as if we're, people of that era would know what that meant, although there's only two people, right? But people would know, oh, that's that part of the day. Okay, so there's, there's two of those kind of definitive conclusions I think you can draw from the text. However, there must have been enough time between the eating of the forbidden fruit and Yahweh coming to the garden for them to fashion their fig leaves, right? So he, it was, there was some kind of a gap. I don't know if that was minutes or hours, but there was some gap in the time so that they could go hastily or maybe with a little more leisure, make these fig leaves and get themselves covered. Something, you know, some, some kind of time gap whether that's minutes or hours, I don't know, but there's, I believe the text would indicate a time gap between when they sinned and their opportunity to make fig leaves and then God coming and walking in the cool of the garden. I believe that demonstrates God was patient and long-suffering as we see all through Old and New Testament that God is. He's always patient and always long-suffering with his image bearers of man. I believe he gave them enough time to repent and confess to him of what they had done, but instead they determined to sow fig leaves, resulting in an act, as I said, of false religion. So I think they could have fallen down on their knees and said, oh Lord God, we have sinned, please have mercy on us, and, and just let it be with that. But they instead used that opportunity not to repent, but to go figure out a way to solve the problem, at least in their own mind. Sure. Okay, well, uh, what I'm saying is they're tr they, they, so humanity, whether we admit it or not, it doesn't matter how, much, how atheistic we are, we know that God's word is written in our hearts. We recognize that certain things are sin, whether that's lying or whether that's murder or whether that's adultery or all of these things. All of humanity knows that stuff is wrong, right? But rather than saying, I, I've got a problem, I'm a sinner, I need a savior, right? Uh, we then engage in something else. Atheists just figure out, ah, it's okay, I won't deal with it. But all of those other religions always try to go, well, if I just get myself in a scale where God grades on the curve and if, if all of my good works outweigh some of my bad stuff, God will, it must accept me because my good works. Yeah, I'll tithe more. I'll donate more time to the church. And somehow that erases things. And God doesn't work that way. If you have sin in our lives, it has to be dealt with judicially. And so it's the false religion of believing that man can solve man's problems without God. And then somehow having solved our problem will make ourselves acceptable in God's sight. And I think that's, that's the false religion, is trying to prove ourselves worthy before God not thinking and asking, God, how do I do that? We just do it. And that's that false religion. So they're working to cover themselves over. That terminology of covering over is atonement. And it really means I'm going I'm to make you know, some kind of restitution or reconciliation with God because of my works to get my sin dealt with. And that's why I think that's what they were doing. This is why I think this is a foundation of not just some false religion, but really all false religions, because people want to be right with God, but they really want to do it on their terms, not God's terms. And that's false religion. Okay. So knowing that God was approaching their position, they hid themselves from his presence. I put hid again in quotation marks, because how does someone hide themselves from an all-knowing God? Right. But they attempted to do that very thing. This really reveals uh, their lack of understanding that God knows all things, including their hiding place. Like, oh, God doesn't know where we're hiding. No, oh, God knows where you're hiding. Okay. Um, and you know, he also knows what they have done by eating this forbidden fruit. So it's not difficult to imagine, I believe, for most of us, the wide range of emotions they must have felt for the first time when they heard the sound of Yahweh approaching. 
Right? Can you imagine? You've, you, you surely put your hand in the cookie jar or something at home when you were growing up and realized mom just is going to find out or you, whatever, you know, my brother and I used to do or whatever, throw baseballs or tennis balls in the house and you break mom's vase or whatever and you're like, ah, how do we, you know, maybe she won't notice if we just throw it all in the trash, you know, whatever. I mean, what kind of emotions are we dealing with here that would cause them, you know, what, what they would be feeling, oh, that's God. He's like 50 yards away and he's walking right towards us. <gasps> Can you imagine the emotions they would have been feeling and the shivering and hiding and cowering in the bushes or whatever, trying to hide themselves from God's presence? Which they had never experienced before. But these are all kinds of emotions that must have, I would think, flooded their human psyche at the time they heard him coming. Uh, so some of them might be things like panic, yeah, fear, regret, shame, contempt for their own existence. And I'm going to put that in the sense like Job cursing the day of his birth because he recognized, you know, ah, oh, my existence is so insufferable that, you know, I just wish that I'd never been born. And he says in like cursing the day he was born. Could they imagine curse, you know, cursing themselves for even being created by the God who brought them into existence? Um, so, you know, whatever they were feeling, I think that probably kind of gives some indications of what they probably felt. And then Yahweh calls out to Adam asking, where are you, Adam? I imagine it was a pleasant tone. I imagine it wasn't harsh and condemning. I think it was, where are you? Okay, I'm not trying to scare him deeper into the bushes. He's actually trying to call him out from the bushes. And I think as with any question God asks, how many times do you see in Scripture God asks somebody a question? Does God need information? No, he's not interested in information. What he's interested in is the heart of the person who will respond to the question. Will Adam retrench and, and lie? Will he continue on in his false religion and his help? You know, he's not asking about where are you? I can't find you. He's asking Adam, I want to hear from you after you've sinned. Tell me what is going on. Okay, he's trying to find out the heart of the man by giving him an open question to respond to. So, what's, what, well, not everything here is all that praiseworthy about what Adam did in taking the fruit and kind of the way he responds. Notice that he doesn't compound his error here by lying. He does, in fact, come clean to God as to where he is. Hey, I'm over here, God, and why he's in hiding. I was, a sh I was afraid because I was naked, right? He comes clean. This is why I'm taking the action I have. So he hasn't gone all the way into, you can't find me, and nothing's wrong, I'm still totally clothed with, or I'm unashamed of my nakedness, right? He, he hears God, and then he responds. Okay, he's like, I can't hide from God, so let me respond. So he doesn't deceive or lie to God about what the situation is. So he responds, hey, God, I was afraid. I recognized I was naked, I confessed that I'm naked, and I'm afraid. Okay, so he's telling God the truth. So he hid him, but he did hide himself, really, <clears throat> as we see, to avoid the consequences of the sin. Right? So he's, <clears throat> sorry, he's hiding himself because he doesn't really want to face the fact that he's a sinner and God has already told him what the consequence of his sin is going to be. So he then um, just you know, moves on into you know, ex explaining, I hid myself, I'm, an, I'm naked, I'm hiding myself, and I'm afraid. What am I afraid of? Of God's actual judgment on my sin. So, so far, Adam has not added, as I said, to his original transgression by lying, but he's certainly not facing God with an honest and trusting heart, is he? Okay, so he's not lying. Oh, I didn't eat the fruit. Nope, no, nope, I, I don't know where it went. I don't, you know, it must have been a bird who ate the fruit, you know. No, he's not lying, but he's, and he's not adding to the transgression of the original sin, but he's obviously not trusting God that God will hear and respond in a loving and compassionate way to what has occurred. So Yahweh then follows up with a more direct question concerning the man's condition. So he says, where are you? And he got a good answer, good enough. But then, he, of course, God follows up with a, another question. Okay? So he asked the man question, who informed you that you were naked? How did you come about this understanding of this information? Right? I would think there's only two ways that man could know that he was naked. Because he was naked in chapter 2, 
before the fall and unashamed. So either someone told him, hey, you're naked. Did you know you're naked? Or he'd eaten from the forbidden fruit, which would cause him to know directly that he was naked, right? So God is asking him a legitimate question. Who told you that you were naked? How did you come about to find this information? Since there was no one else around to communicate to Adam that he was naked, no other human beings, Yahweh then asked him directly, okay, so have you eaten from the tree of the fruit, which I commanded you not to eat from? You know, is that how you know you're naked? He's asking him a question because that's a reasonable question to ask, especially if there's only two ways he could possibly have that information. So here we see Adam's response was not a lie, but he clearly did not have an attitude of humility or remorse for his actions, did he? Okay. Well, the woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate, right? So he also clearly did not take responsibility for his own sinful conduct. Like, yeah, I ate it, but it would have never happened if you hadn't given me the woman. It was her fault, right? I mean, we're seeing that flavor of his confession. The woman whom you gave to be with me, you, God, gave her to me, right? God, it must be your fault, okay? The man claimed the woman was the cause of his failure, kind of trying to proclaim that somehow, some way, he was truly innocent at heart that just sort of happened. He thought that God gave her the woman and the woman was speaking, you know, who knows what, but he's clearly not taking proper responsibility for his conduct. So according to Adam, since God gave the woman to him, then God should, have, should also bear the blame for Adam's sinful choice and failure because he's not going to take, he's not trying to take direct responsibility. Without lying, how many times do we, do we ourselves wander that little edge, right? We don't really want to take responsibility. We don't really want to lie. So we flirt with the little edge of sharing just enough information without actually fully representing our conduct properly. And so Adam's transgression continues to infect all of us today, doesn't it? So only after attempting to shift blame does the man confess he ate the fruit, right? So he says, the woman who you gave to me to be with me, she gave it to me, and I ate. You see that progression? He didn't say, I ate because the woman was with me. He said, the woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit, and I ate. It's kind of this last-ditch effort to be honest at the very end of the dialogue. So I say that Adam acknowledged the minimum amount of blame possible for this action. And I ate. Three words in English, right? Like he didn't just say, oh, it looks so good. It was so, I was just convinced it was the right thing to do, Lord. And, you know, he just gives him the minimal amount of information. And I ate. Right? It's just trying to be as, as brief as possible with his confession about his actions. But having confessed his transgression, Yahweh, notice, you notice, didn't ex, uh, demand further explanation. Instead, he just simply moves on to the woman. Right? He got what he needed out of the woman. The man confessed, I ate. You and I, or God, might not have liked exactly how Adam handled himself in that situation, but he got, God got the confession. The man honestly proclaimed that he transgressed and sinned and ate of the fruit. So he turns to the woman. And Yahweh then demanded that the woman reveal what, what she had done. He didn't ask her, where are you or have you eaten? He's taking Adam's word as truth and says, what is this thing that you have done? Okay. And then like her husband, of course, the woman attempts to shift blame and also assumed at the end the minimum amount of responsibility possible in confessing this sin to God. So, like Adam, she was truthful. She said the serpent deceived her, and he did, right? We recognize the serpent deceived her. Uh, but deception, of course, does not excuse sin. You can't, none of us can stand before God's throne and say, oh, I wouldn't have sinned if I wasn't deceived by it. No, you, you have to take responsibility for your own actions, look to God's truth, and know that all deception is, a, is coming against God's truth and God's word. So it's our responsibility to hold firm to truth, not to be deceived. But deception is always an attack of the enemy. 
Okay, so it's, it's, it, but it, and it certainly doesn't serve as an excuse for the willful violation of anything that God commands you and I to do, or Eve. So Eve, as Adam did, then acknowledges the eating of the fruit. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Right? She's doing the same exact thing that Adam did, confessing, but only after she set up the scenario by which it really wasn't all, really all that much my fault. Okay. So that's the man and the woman. God, Yahweh God got everything that he needed out of both, a confession of their sin. And then he turns to the serpent, and notice he doesn't question the serpent. He doesn't expect the father of lies to tell him anything truthful. Right? So that's what Jesus calls Satan in John 8, 44, the father of lies. I won't take you there, but that's what he says. Satan is the father of lies. So he doesn't ask the serpent what he's done. He, God, of course, already knows what everybody in this scenario has done. And so he's going to turn to the serpent, and he's now going to bring forth judgment on all three participants in this transgression in the garden. Okay. So the next section here in verses 14 and 15 is Yahweh is going to curse the serpent. So curse number one, he tells the serpent, is going to be more cursed than all of the cattle. Now cattle aren't cursed, they're not a problem, but the serpent who, was, who once aspired, as we looked at last week, to ascend to the highest place in heaven, to sit on the throne and be like God himself. Okay? He once aspired to be that high, he's now going to be lower than the rank of livestock in his status anywhere. He's not, he's not going to be eliminated, uh, annihilated by God for this transgression. There's, God still has a purpose for Satan, even though he fell, even though he deceived Eve in the garden. He, but he's going to be ranked lower than the lowliest of animals, if you will, in the, in the animal pen. Um, he's, and, cause he's, and he's going to be crawling around on his belly. So he's now restricted. Now, we talked about this. Maybe it was a dragon you know, or what we might call a dinosaur or whatever, you know, and he was able to walk, you know, if we're talking, you know, remember we talked about the kind of different views of what this creature may have been. Well, either figuratively or literally, now he's sort of got his legs stripped off and his only form of mobility is to slither along the ground, which is not a particularly, in my mind, graceful or honoring position for someone who aspires to great things to be in. Now, there's nothing wrong with the beautiful design that God made for worms and snakes and things like that that with, can leglessly c crawl around the earth. Sidewinders are incredible. Watch those things go across the desert. But no, no animal that once had legs would go, well, that seems like a better way to go, right? If we had legs, we'd use them. But here we're seeing this, you are going to crawl along the earth. Now, this does in very much is consistent with what we see like in Job. You know, in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, Satan comes and presents himself before God, and God asks him a question again, not needing the information, but asks him a question. You know, what have you been up to? Oh, I've just been wandering to and fro on the earth, right? I mean, he's, he hasn't been in heaven. He's up wandering to and fro, and now he's crawling on his belly. He's, he's in a, it, what we're seeing here is a picture of absolute disgrace for that anointed cherub that covers that, uh, that Ezekiel talks about, right? So he's, he's being disgraced right here before man and all of creation. The serpent is at the lowest level. And curse number three, he will eat dust all of his days. Now, no, I don't think any graceful or respected animal consumes dust for their nutrition. There's some, but I mean, we you know, talk about you know, bo you know, bottom feeders in the ocean and you know, scavengers and you know, things like that that do all eat kind of just stuff that we would find incredibly gross. But, you know, what do we think of when we're thinking about, you know, majestic animals and, and whatnot? I mean, they're, they're not walking around eating dust, right? They're, this is kind of the lowest of the low, eating the worst of the worst is the picture that God is painting for us. But, of course, really, I think the, in the main point here is that dust is also a euphemism for mankind, whom God made from the dust. So his, his position now is going to be in a battle with God. God is going to do all he can do with a free will agency of man to deliver man from Satan's power, deliver man from the original sin that Adam then brought into the world. But ser the serpent is constantly going to be at odds with God and be focused on man. 
And so he's going to be looking to consume as much of mankind as he can in this battle that's going on. So he's going to eat dust all the days of his life. He's going to literally try to destroy mankind. Um, that doesn't mean that's what, uh, that God is pleased by what, what Satan is doing, but God can use the wicked man and wicked uh, spiritual beings, including Satan, to accomplish even better purposes, which is why we'd expect Satan to still be here, because God is using his malevolency and hatred towards God and hatred towards mankind to bring about a result that if he wasn't here, maybe would be significantly worse. Meaning, if Satan and evil didn't exist, how many free will agents would do just what, God, what, what Adam and Eve did in the garden and go, oh yeah, we got that loving God in heaven, but I want to make my own choices and I'll never turn to God. It's, it's those deep, dark consequences of sin and the world, fallen world that we live in and crying out for pain because of sickness and disease and relationship problems and job problems and all kinds of other problems that God uses to draw us to himself because the adage there's no uh, atheists in foxholes has that same connotation everywhere. If everything were going well, well, we, we, most of us would not turn to God. Okay? It's what, what is, it the, the, in, is it Proverbs where he says, don't make me rich that I don't need you, and don't make me poor that I would steal, and uh, you know, make me somewhere in the middle so that I'm always reliant on you, but, but you know, never so good that I never, never think about you. Right. So anyway, um, I think that's what we're seeing here with this curse on Satan. The fourth curse is enmity between the, specifically saying there's going to be enmity, which means an absolute hatred and war or battle going on between the woman and the serpent. Okay? They're going to be, there's an enmity, the perpetual enmity between the existence of the serpent and all that he can coerce into his kingdom and the woman who represents all the life of all mankind is how Adam names her Eve at the end of the chapter. Okay, this constant battle between the serpent and mankind for all eternity, or at least all of this current time frame that we live in. So the serpent will act in rage against all the offspring of the woman. Boy, read Revelation chapter 12 if you want confirmation of that. I didn't, didn't uh, quote those verses here, but he, he does, it does say specifically the, the, the serpent of old, the dragon of old, is enraged at the woman who represents the plan of God, the nation of Israel. So especially those whom God has specially appointed for and promised his salvation through and so the serpent are he's always going to be this raging battle. And as we talked about, we've been talking about on Sunday morning, that battle is raging in the land of Israel. It's been going on for 4,000 years as Satan continually tries to attack the chosen people of God, the plan of God, and all of that. There is, there's not an accident that you can't get peace in the Middle East, can't get peace in Israel for 4,000 years. It's not because humans haven't tried hard enough, it's because Satan won't let go of his hatred and rage towards God's plan and God's people. So while the serpent has achieved and will continue to achieve what I'll call tactical victories, he will lose the significant battles between himself and the seed of the woman. That's what's being prophesied here in Genesis 3.15. So the curse number five is, in fact, the seed of the serpent really doing battle with the seed of the woman over the course of human history. So it, it can be a reference to the angels who fell with Satan. The seed, you know, what, 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 what does he mean by the seed of the serpent? Well, it can be, the, can be like all of those, perhaps one-third of the angels that fell. Okay? But it may, ultimately, we're going to see in our timeline, and it may be very soon on our horizon, we don't know, that the seed of the serpent will ultimately be the man of sin, the man of perdition, the Antichrist, whom Satan will empower in the last day. There will be this battle between an Antichrist that the New Testament talks pretty extensively about in end times passages, and of course Satan, who's going to emp who empowers him, and of course the ultimate victory for Christ. This is a foreshadowing 
of 6,000 years or so of battles that will culminate in the defeat of Satan and the victory of Christ, both on the cross, but ultimately at the end of the age. So while the serpent seed will bruise the heel, let's call that the crucifixion, of the woman seed, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent in total victory for God and man. Now that word, bruise his heel, can mean death, by the way. It says, he says to the serpent, the seed of the woman will bruise your head, but he, or, or, he will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Okay? That word for bruise doesn't indicate, oh, that's just a little minor little, little, little scuffle. It can even mean death, okay, that word for bruising there. But obviously crushing the head of the serpent is meaning like, it's it, it's over, it's done, you're going to be defeated in the end, and which is exactly what Revelation talks about. Okay. And so the seed of the woman is really a clear reference to Jesus Christ. You can look at Galatians 4 and other places where we see a clear reference to the seed of the woman is a reference to Jesus Christ. Okay. It's a seed promise to Eve, it's a seed promise to Abraham, and Abraham's descendants after him. So biologically, this is a reference only makes sense, though, if, if you haven't thought about this, in light of a virgin birth. Because in all of the animal kingdom, when you're talking about at least, you know, you got uh, two genders or two sexes of animals, the seed comes from the male and the egg comes from the female. So why is he telling the woman about a seed when it's the man in the relationship that provides, certainly in human relationships, provides the seed? This is another indication of a virgin birth, or the first indication of a virgin birth in Scripture. The woman will have a seed. That's biologically inconsistent. So this particular verse, Genesis 3.15, is commonly understood to be the first presentation of the gospel account in all of Scripture. They call it the proto-evangelium, okay? meaning the first presentation of the gospel. The seed of the woman the seed of the serpent, the battle, and the victory of Christ in all of that. So while the details of this prophecy being fulfilled are limited in Genesis, obviously you go, you read one verse in Genesis 3.15 and go, well, I'm having a hard time picturing Christ in all of that, but this is just the first in a slow unveiling of who Christ is throughout the rest of the Old Testament and leading into the full revelation in the New Testament. And it's a battle between Christ and Satan. But such a battle is not a contest between, among equals. Christ and Satan are not equals. They're not brothers. This is, you know, that's absolute heresy, right? This is, not, this is not a battle between equals. It's rather God working out his glorious purpose by allowing Satan to unwittingly accomplish God's plan for creation. Satan isn't doing anything cooperatively or, or, or knowingly fulfilling God's will. God keeps using his malevolence and his hatred against him and gets victory every single time. God is using what, God, what Satan is intending for evil, God's intending for good, as Genesis 50 will talk about with Joseph and his brothers. Yeah. So finally, uh, curse number six, the serpent's head will be crushed by his archenemy, the man. And Satan is uh, clearly offered no hope of redemption Right And Hebrews 2.16 talks about God didn't become an angel to save angels. He became a man to save men in Christ Jesus. Okay? So there is, when, when Satan fell, there was no hope for his redemption. Uh, it's just, just the way it ha- has to be in God's kingdom. As I said, I think last week, there's no, you know, when you're in God's perfect presence already, there's no faith involved. And so faith is the only way of coming to God and, and receiving salvation. Angels can't have faith because they've already seen him face to face. They've already seen all of that. Man can have faith because we haven't yet seen him face to face. So let's take our break, and then we'll um, yeah move on. Yeah, let's take our break right there. Yeah. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm saying he's going to bruise his heel. He's going to he's going to crush his head. I mean, it's going to be a, a yeah. So. Um, 
Oh, bruise on both sides of the equation? It says bruised on both sides? Yeah, it's bruised, of course, it's much different. Yeah, I can look at those uh, between the breaks here, but, um, but it's, it, there's, I think there's a different distinction between the two. What, what, how Satan has an impact in this minor skirmish victory against the Messiah, Christ, and how Satan, or Satan will ultimately receive full and total complete defeat by the end victory at the end times. Okay. All right, let's take four or five minutes and come back.